I will not believe. A week later, the disciples were again shut in the house, and Thomas was with them. And although the doors were shut, Jesus again came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not be disbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Thomas has a nickname, doesn't he? It's a nickname he gets from this story. It's not the twin, is it? The, name, the nickname John says he already has. It's not Thomas the pragmatic one, the one who asks the right questions and just wants to see a little evidence. In spite of this powerful confession we get in this story, we don't call him confessing Thomas, do we? In John's Gospel, Thomas has the singular distinction of being the one and only person in the entire story to ever correctly identify Jesus and show that he knows what that means. John's Gospel doesn't have the story of Peter and his confession on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. Neither does John's Gospel have the Gentile centurion who, after Jesus' death, correctly figures out who he is. Instead, in place of both of them, here is Thomas exclaiming, My Lord and my God. But we do not call him confessing Thomas, do we? What do we call him? Doubting. Doubting Thomas. Why is that? Why not the twin or pragmatic Thomas or Thomas the confessor? With all that's going on in this story, not one but two resurrection appearances by Jesus and the commissioning of the apostles and the giving of the Holy Spirit and the institution of the office of the keys and this incredible confession that Thomas makes, why is doubting Thomas the detail that sticks with us? Having been in the church as long as I have, I have come to wonder if doubt frightens us. Maybe that's why we pick up that detail. Why else have we spend so much time comparing ourselves in the church to the people who are out there, who don't believe as we do, wondering how they could possibly make it through life without faith? What else besides fear would have us wringing our hands and shedding our tears over spouses and children who have left the church behind? I wonder if we use this story of doubting Thomas as a kind of cautionary tale to warn ourselves against doubt. Maybe in this story we can let Thomas do the doubting for us, and then when he's corrected, we can stand with the disciples and pretend that we have been certain all along, just as they were. Maybe when Thomas is brought back into the fold, we can imagine all, that all the other doubters out there are being brought back in with him, and that gives us some comfort. But I can't help but notice something. If that's what we're asking this story to do, to be a cautionary tale against doubt, this story falls flat. Because Jesus never scolds or reprimands Thomas for his doubt, does he? Nobody does. In fact, Jesus actually indulges him. Jesus comes back a second time specifically to give Thomas what he asks for. In fact, I wonder if Thomas could have made that incredible confession without having first doubted. All the other disciples were there for that first appearance, but none of them made a confession like that, did they? If anything, it makes me wonder if this is maybe a story in praise of doubt. 
Maybe doubt is something that we in the church ought to celebrate, encourage even, trusting that doubt is a resource that God can use to great effect, like with Thomas. I wonder if we might be so afraid of Thomas's doubt that we miss the truly amazing thing that is happening to Thomas and to all the disciples in this story. And in order to see that, I want to draw your attention to three words in this story. Three words that I think describe, all describe the same thing. The first one is what Jesus says when he somehow comes through that locked door and greets his friends. He says, peace be with you, right? Now, in Aramaic or Hebrew, the word he used would have been shalom. Now, shalom is a typical greeting in Aramaic and Hebrew. To this day, Jews still greet each other by saying shalom to one another. It's like, hello. But St. John, our storyteller, is not a reporter or an ethnographer. He's a poet and a theologian. He chooses each and every word that he uses very, very carefully. And so when he says that Jesus, in his first appearance after his resurrection to his friends, says shalom, he means a lot more than just hello. In Hebrew, shalom means peace. But it means a lot more than the English word peace. Shalom is not just the absence of conflict or an easy calm. It is wholeness and wellness and perfection. Shalom is the last piece in a puzzle fitted into place. Shalom is the moment when you greet your family in the airport after a long separation. Shalom is the sense that, to borrow from Robert Browning, God's in his heaven and all's right with the world. Shalom is the word used to describe how everything will be when Messiah returns and God's kingdom is fully established. That is what Jesus wishes his friends. The second word comes after Thomas's confession when Jesus points out that others, like us, have not seen and yet have come to believe. And Jesus says, blessed are those once again, that English word blessed falls short. The Greek word is makarios, and it means something like blessed, but also something like happy or fortunate or lucky. But it also doesn't really mean any of those things because blessedness and happiness and fortune or luck all have very specific meanings in English. And makarios kind of encompasses something with all of those, but beyond them. It's the same word that Jesus uses in the Beatitudes when he says things like, blessed are the poor. Clearly, that's not a blessing or fortune, good fortune to be poor. But Jesus says there's something else there, some happiness, some fortunateness that comes with that. And the third word comes from the narrator's explanation of why he's sharing these stories with us at all. St. John says that his explicit purpose in recording all of this and other stories is so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. There are two Greek words for life. You know them both, even if you don't speak any Greek. The first word is bios, which is the root of our word biology, right? Bios refers to the mechanics of being alive. To have bios means that your heart is pumping blood and your lungs are breathing air and your synapses are firing. But St. John uses the other word, zoe. That's the root of our words zoo and zoology. It refers to life in the sense of life on earth or to be fully alive rather than merely surviving. It's the word Jesus uses when he says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. This is something beyond just being physically alive. It's 
some quality to life that not everybody has. Each of these three words, shalom and makarios and zoe, are hard to define by themselves. They sort of exist in the crevices between our English words. But together, I wonder if they might define one another. And what happens to Thomas and his friends in this story. See, at the beginning of the story, Thomas, like his friends, is grief-stricken and afraid. Maybe he's angry, too. I wonder if there might be some anger in that declaration that he cannot believe. But by the end of the story, he's falling down in worship. He's making a statement about Jesus that is bold and life-changing. I don't just hear joy or relief or excitement in this confession. There's something more there. I think something in Thomas has changed. I wonder if at some level the man who exclaims, My Lord and my God is a different man entirely from the one who says, I will not believe. There is a word that captures what Jesus and John are talking about. As I read this story, I think that if we put Shalom and Makarios and Zoe together, we end up with the word resurrection. You see, resurrection, Easter is not just about the resurrection of a single person, even if that person was the Son of God. Easter is about the resurrection of all humankind, of all creation. It's about this life that is available to us abundantly through Jesus. The word in Greek kind of means a lifting up or a standing up, a rising. Easter is the uplifting of all creation, just like Thomas is uplifted. In the story, Thomas receives new life, receives resurrection. And John is hoping that by hearing this story, we too might experience that, resur that resurrection with him. That we might become makarios with him. That we might receive God's shalom and experience zoe that is abundant and eternal. So I wonder, what might that look like? As we listen to this story, as we watch this transformation of Thomas, what does this story do to us? What promise does this story hold for ourselves, for others, or for creation? I have to believe a promise that powerful transcends just the promise of life after death. That it has to include some sort of transfer transformation now. Transformation like the one Thomas experiences. I think that's what we talk about when we talk about baptism. About dying and rising with Christ. Doubt may be the least interesting part of this story. I find what happened to Thomas to be far more compelling. Something, the appearance of Jesus, the solidarity of his friends, something gives Thomas a new life. A shalom that passes understanding, that helps him feel truly makarios, that gives him zoe, beyond simple life. And I believe that we read this story in the hope and in the faith that that same thing is available to us on Easter and every day through the gift of baptism.